Welcome everyone. This is Sharon Kyle of the LA Progressive and we are so fortunate today to have Holly Mitchell, who is a member of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors in California, representing District 2. She assumed office on December 7th, 2020. Her current term ends on December 2nd, 2024. She ran for election in the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors to represent District 2 in California and she won in the general election on November the 3rd. Before she was the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors District 2 representative, Ms. Mitchell served in the California State Assembly and the California State Senate. Welcome, Holly Mitchell. And please tell me, how should I refer to you? Uh, if Sharon, if you let me call you Sharon, I'd be honored if you call me Holly. Please call me Sharon. Yes, Holly, please I will call, call you me Holly. Holly. <laughs> well, Thank you, it's such a pleasure um, to, to have you here with us today. And I'm just gonna jump right in. I have, I'm just so pleased because you've been one of the electeds in the state of California who I have admired most. And I'm not just saying that because you're here. It's really true that it is how I feel about you. Now this year you passed a motion on poverty alleviation and guaranteed basic income. Can you share why this, may, this motion is so significant? So thank you and I appreciate you and your husband and all the work that you have done in writing about some of my work in the LA Progressive. I appreciate it. You know, sometimes as a policymaker, trying to get the word out about our hard won battles and even sometimes our losses, just to make sure that people understand what your elected representatives are doing on your behalf. So I appreciate your tireless commitment to progressive politics and progressive values. So thank you. So yes, you know, I took office just over a year ago now in the middle of a public health and economic pandemic, you know, great time to try to onboard into a new job, Holly. Um, but, you know, I have always been um, really values driven in terms of what called me to public office. So spent an important early time building what has turned out to be the most amazing team of people who share my core values um, about why we are in public service, about what our why is. We talk a lot about our why as a team. Um, it was a part of folks' interviews, you know, why do you wanna come work for me and what's your why? What calls you to public service? And so part of my why, Sharon, really goes back to my parents who met as eligibility workers working for the Department of Public Social Services. I had the most amazing experience yesterday one of the first young women on my mother's caseload called, found me on Facebook. Mitchell is my maiden name. And reached out to me on Facebook and sent me this message about the impact my mother as a social worker had on her life. She was a runaway at 11. She is now 68. And the message she sent me uh, had me in tears all morning, just to be perfectly frank, because it was a reminder of what one person can do to change the trajectory of the life of another person. And that's my why. And, you know, I was raised in this household of these two people who, who, who believe that to their core. And so the guaranteed basic income for me is um, a wonderful opportunity to mature or advance our conversation about poverty alleviation, particularly multi-generational. Um, you know, as a policymaker, you know, I ran Crystal Stairs, subsidized childcare program, uh, our efforts in the nonprofit sector to help working families end multi-generational poverty by placing your children in high quality, nurturing early care and education experiences, settings, to give them a leg up once they are into school and they're truly school ready. Um, and this has been my life's work. And so at the state level, really working to make sure that the state entitlement programs um, weren't quite frankly, Sharon, as racist and sexist as they had become, right? You know, we are criminalizing poverty. We are blaming poor people for being poor. And watching uh, Mayor Tubbs, Michael Tubbs, the former mayor of Stockton, launch this program, a program that I'd read about many years ago that was a part of 
you know, Dr. King's original vision and his war on poverty. I thought here I am at the right place at the right time in the middle of a public health and economic pandemic where for the first time in my life, the lack of resources cannot be the excuse for government to not do the right thing. We've got the money. So here we have federal dollars. We have a, a model that's been tested and researched based on the Stockton experience. Um, so this is an opportunity for me to really lean in hard and test current new theory and models about what it really takes from um, an informed place to address poverty in a meaningful way. I'm proud to say that our model will be the largest in the country. Um, when you think about what we're gonna do at LA County for residents living in unincorporated LA County, in addition to what the city of LA is gonna do, Compton, Long Beach, West Hollywood, LA County residents in, in relatively significant numbers will have this important investment in them that they choose how to spend that money. You know, Cal Works and public benefits often have so many strings, but to hear the young women in Compton whose program is already launched, talk about, it gave me room to breathe. The extra $500 a month gave me room to breathe. To start a little savings because I want to buy a house. That's how we end multi-generational poverty. We allow people to acquire family wealth and property ownership helps you do that. So the LA County pilot will be three years. It will be the longest pilot, $1,000 a month for people to go back to school, you know, uh, get, get that piece of car we own fixed so I can travel a little farther to perhaps find one full-time job versus piecemealing part-time jobs where I can take tra public transportation to get to, um, maybe get my third grader some tutoring in math. Um, or you know what, Sharon? Take a family vacation. Go to, take the babies to the San Diego Zoo for the week, right? Things that we know pour into children, help strengthen family ties, like the sister said, just give me, it gave me room to breathe. And as a single working parent, I understand those times when I didn't really have room to breathe compared to what I did and the difference it makes in my life and made in my son's life, right? That's what a guaranteed basic income is shifting the public policy discussion toward. And I'm so excited to be in this position, to be, to be a part of that. Yeah, and you can, you can tell that, or well, I can tell that what you're saying is genuinely felt, it's authentic, that it's coming from a very real place. It is. And, and, and you're informed about the lives of these people because you know who these people are. I know who those people are. I've been those people. Hello, so, exactly. So let me move on to the next question. Okay. So you were elected to the Board of Supervisors November 3rd, 2020, making it the first time in history that we had an all female led board. Can you talk about the significance of making history in that way? Well, Sharon, I hope if you haven't seen it, you will take a look. The um, executive office of the Board of Supervisors produced the most amazing video. I choked up when I first saw it. Uh, Cause frankly, I, I think they take my segment so early last year and it feels like this year, it feels like dog years. It feels like it's been set, you know, we, we've worked so hard, gotten so much done. So I'd forgotten what I said. I'd really forgotten about the project until I saw the final project, the final product. And it's called the first to five. And it chronicles the history of the LA County Board of Supervisors and how for LA County's vast majority of the county's existence, it has been an all male body. They interview the two first first. They interview a beautiful interview of Yvonne Brathwaite Burke, a beautiful interview of Gloria Molina, talking about what it was like in those days to be the only, and that it wasn't easy. And then the two of them give the five of us advice. Then they interview the five of us. And you know, when you think about the five of us, Hilda Solis, Holly Mitchell, Catherine Barger, Janice Hahn, Sheila Kuehl, the one 
thing we all do have in common is our gender. We're a very diverse group of women with different life experiences. Um, you know, everyone from a labor secretary to former legislators, former members of Congress, long-term county um, advocate employee, just an incredible diversity in terms of what we bring to our deliberations on Tuesdays uh, at the Hall of Administration. And so it's been exciting. It was fun to make history. Um, and it also gives me an opportunity to talk about, you know, what I know to be true unapologetically. Women lead differently. I'm not saying better or worse. We just lead differently. We bring a different perspective, a different skill set. The Center for the American Woman in Politics at Rutgers University has charted for decades elected bodies um, and, and how the policy making experience is different based on women being present and when they're not. You know, they chronicled what was going to happen in California after term limits passed, and we and we lost all the black women who served in the legislature were gone. And for for a good number of years, embarrassingly, Sharon, there were no black women in the California legislature. When Teresa Hughes, the time between when Teresa Hughes termed out and Karen Bass was elected, it was years with no representation. And, and it has a direct impact on the policy that comes out of these elected bodies. I know there were times that my mere presence in the room, whether I opened my mouth or not, my merely being there, impacted the conversation and the outcome. It just did. Now, you know, if I was in the room, more often than not, I was saying something, Sharon, but I'm just saying, just being in the room, being present. And so, as you have mentioned, and I've read your pieces about representation matters, it absolutely does. And I can tell you from having worked on the outside, trying to advocate. I was with the California Black Women's Health Project at the time there were no Black women in the legislature. I know what that felt like trying to elevate a Black women's health agenda. And I know what it's like to have been in the room when I know my presence altered the outcome um, of a policy conversation, quite frankly, for the better betterment of the policy and everybody. It's not that because I was there, Black women, um, um, you know, got ahead. No, because I was there and the perspective I bring, my life experience created a policy that lifted all boats, quite frankly. That's right. That's right. And then and, and that's why I often talk about the centrality of race, because if we focus on that, we end up with a society that's better for all. So without question. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important that constituents' needs are met as we push forward, uh, forward towards recovery. Can you share what work you are taking on to ensure an equitable recovery? I am so glad you said that because um, when I was building my team a year ago now, um, I uh, worked with a wonderful consulting firm, Slack Global Consulting, uh, who helped me build teams in the past, who helped me do staff retreats to really get to the root of our individual and collective why. And we, and remember, we're doing all this remotely, like to have a staff retreat via Zoom. I was like, this is never going to work. And then I was the number one cheerleader when I saw all the tools available using technology that really allowed us to build team, even though we were all, you know, participating from home. And she built that we could see on screen using some program that allows you to write a sticky note. I love sticky notes and stick them. And we could do sticky notes virtually. And, you know, equity was at the center and the core of this vision board that we were building together. We envisioned what a second district would look like that allows our children to grow and thrive and allows the rest of us to grow old with dignity. And in building that equity was at the center. So how do we now translate that to policy? Well, I'm proud to say that we have led by passing motions, um, looking at the new funding coming from the federal government, both the CARES Act funding, the first tranche of dollars, and the second, the American Rescue Plan dollars. And, 
have carried motions and co-opted motions requiring that an equity lens, an equity um, algorithm be used in the administration of those funds, in the dispensing of those funds, in those programs, and developing those programs. Because the reality, Sharon, is that COVID and this pandemic didn't, is, was not an equal opportunity offender, right? There were communities that were disproportionately harmed and hurt. And in my opinion, the rescue dollars by virtue of their name, rescue dollars should be disproportionately invested in those communities. And so we put wheels in motion before I got to the board, you know, they created initiatives, the anti-racism, the anti-black initiative. Um, and so through um, the, it's, the, it's called ARDI for short, the anti-racism um, and diversity initiative, um, we are helping to build uh, an infrastructure that every department needs to understand um, what equity looks like in real application and fund their programs accordingly. I think that's probably the most significant of our work where I basically said, this is not a divide by five. Um, that equity is probably the most commonly used term outside of, you know, you're on mute <laughs> that we've heard during this pandemic, right? But it was important to talk about now how do we apply, how do we operationalize equity when it comes to resources? And sometimes those are difficult conversations and sometimes they're not. Um, so I think that's some of the most significant work that we've done. The multiple motions we've put in place um, to realize building back equitably. The president says build back better. Where we here in LA County are gonna take that $1.9 billion we got from the American Rescue Plan and build back equitably. We've carried motions around closing the digital divide. Sharon, the, it was a study done that staff brought to my attention that there's a section in my district that I represent, uh, Florence Firestone, Watts Willowbrook, where 30% of the households can't afford internet access. Because I think when I think digital divide, I think it's structural, like people don't have access because it's like not available in your community. No, it's available, people can't afford it. And so we are looking at what the digital divide really is. It's not just not having a device. It's, it's those mothers who had three kids in the household and she didn't have enough devices for everybody to use a device to be in school all day, right? and to have enough bandwidth for three kids to be in school from home all day, every day, and you trying to do your job too. You know, everybody has spotty internet, much less when the whole household is trying to use it at the same time. So those are the digital divide questions that we are challenging and pushing hard to resolve, working with providers, really working with our own county agency with a very, a capable leader to talk about maybe the county builds its own infrastructure to make sure that county residents have equal access. You know, acknowledging the deep pain that we all experience when we look at the growing number of our family, friends, and neighbors who are unhoused, the growing number of our family, friends, and neighbors who are suffering um, from mental illness, substance abuse, and living on the streets and what the county must do to provide appropriate services to partner with other entities around the housing infrastructure, but for the county, because it's the county's lane to do those wraparound services. And so, you know, really having meaningful conversations about behavioral health services, how we um, make sure that uh, we have crisis response teams in every community that are available to respond, to give us an option, to call someone other than 911 when our family members are in the middle of a mental health crisis. Um, so those are some of the real tangible kind of in the weeds things. I can, you know, I'm a bit of a policy wonk, Sharon, I must confess, so I can get down in the weeds, um, but that's where the real work is and that's how we're gonna make a difference for the people who call the second district home. So I'm proud of, yeah. that's just a sampling of some of the work we've done, but it's it makes me, very proud of my team. Great, great. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. When you when you talked about the digital divide in District Two, um, 
it made me think of the wonderful work that um, our friend Kelly Lytle Hernandez has been doing with Million Dollar Hoods. Yes. And I thought about, you know, the lack of investment um, in terms of the dig digital divide in those communities, but then the overemphasis in those communities with, um, you know, police enforcement and, mm -hmm. and the things that, that Kelly at UCLA is measuring, which um, these million dollar hoods, it's my, my husband, Dick Price, just got off of a podcast where he was talking about the, um, the, the, the national budget for the Department of Defense. And I, you know, and, and it's so out of whack with how we invest in social services and the infrastructure of the United States. And I think we, st we see a manifestation of that same um, uh, unbalanced approach, even down in our local neighborhoods, which brings me to my final well, discussion. Well, well, we really do, and which is why the voters of LA County voted for Measure J to direct yes. the county to invest on the front end, that we want to fund you know, cares first, jails last. That's right. And Sheila Kuehl and Hilda and so many of my colleagues um, have, have, have made true their, to their commitment to that. And so the, the county is, is light years ahead of many municipalities across this country. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think I accredit that um, partly maybe to the fact that we have five women in charge and that you are such a force. Um, you, you really are. It, it, it's just who you are inside. Like you said, you don't, when you walk into a room, maybe the conversation changes partly just because of your presence, but partly because you got a big mouth. So, <laughs> and I and appreciate I'm not afraid to use it. When I was a little girl, my dad would say, be careful, Holly could talk to dead people. And it took me a minute to realize, daddy, that's not very flattering, but my talk, my ability to talk in every, in every circle, in every room, um, has carried me far uh, in my career, and uh, I use it to benefit the people I represent. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of my favorite books, um, and, and I think this book was actually written more than 20 years ago, uh, was written by Lonnie Guineer, who, um, for, for people that are listening to this, Lonnie Guineer was selected by then President um, Bill Clinton to be his assistant attorney general, but she didn't make it through the confirmation process. Um, she is one of the first um, black attorney uh, uh, legal professors to get tenure at um, Yale and I believe at Harvard as well. And she co-wrote this book with Gerald Torres. Um, they co-authored a book called The Miner's Canary, Enlisting Race, Resisting Power and Transforming Democracy. And they contend that like the canaries that alerted miners to a poisonous atmosphere in, within, within the, uh, the coal mines, issues of race point to underlying problems in society that ultimately affect everyone, not just racial and ethnic minorities, but it's sort of like a cheat sheet. If you look at what's happening in the black community and, and you can see this, I mean, if you looked at the foreclosure uh, crisis back in 2008, what was happening with Black people losing their homes right before the major foreclosure crisis hit everyone else, if it had been addressed just by looking at the miner's canary, we could have um, got a head start on what was going to have, happen to everyone else. And it's the true with failing public schools, healthcare. So race blindness, which is something that we've attempted to achieve, has failed us. Focusing on individual achievement has diverted us from tackling pervasive social, political, and economic inequalities. And I kind of wanted to talk about, again, representation and how we as a nation, um, you and I had attended a critical race theory um, a symposium at UCLA. And oh gosh, what a wonderful group of people talking about the, the fact that this country lacks racial literacy. How can we get beyond this? Do you, do you have any ideas? I mean, you have served with a body of electeds. Um, what is it? Uh, um, in the Senate, 80 of mm -hmm. 40 of you in the assembly, 80 of you. Then you, now you're on the board of supervisors. And I suspect that many in those bodies lack racial literacy. I'm not going to ask you to, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that. But how do you work with people who really do not understand this? So I'll use, I'll use the Crown Act as the example. You know, I yes, introduced the bill. I introduced the bill when I was in the Senate 
mm-hmm. 28, you know, I lost the COVID year, 2019, I guess. Senate Bill 188, the CROWN Act. CROWN is an acronym creating a respectful and open world for natural hair and natural hairstyles. I am motioning because I am locked, have been for going on 18 years. And I, it came about, Sharon, I was at a national convening of Black policymakers and I was attending a breakfast and heard from A.C. Eagleson Bracey COO of Unilever, parent company of Dove, you know, black woman in the beauty industry, talking about a survey they had conducted where 80% of black women didn't feel that they could wear their hair in a natural hairstyle, locks, Mm -hmm. twists, or braids to the workplace because of public attitudes about it. It lacks professionalism, it's too ethnic, it's too black. It actually violates a workplace dress code. (laughs) You know, it it spanned the gamut. And I thought I'm a leader in the California legislature. I chaired the Senate budget committee that put me on the leadership team. I am locked. I ran for office locked. Um, I made it a point during my first campaign in 2010 to tell my consultants my hair is not an option. You know, I've been to the trainings, how you run for office. And so I've heard what um, consultants will say to women who are running for office. Don't wear your big hoop ear. You know, they think, you know, there's this notion that we have to be mainstream. We remember how people talked about Hillary Clinton. Women are judged differently as candidates. And I made the conscious decision that I felt the people who lived in my community would, were sophisticated enough to know that the the standard they should hold me to was based on what's inside my head, my work history, my commitment to them versus how I choose to wear my hair. And and I was right, I won. So I thought, I think I'm the perfect person to to, to talk about this and, and figure out a way that we can create a protection under the law. So we introduced the bill. And so there are a couple of clips that I have seen now that have gone viral a couple of times of me presenting the bill in both committee and on the floor where I stood up and said, I, you know, I've served with many of you for many years. You may have had questions. So this is not only about us passing this bill or, or you hearing this bill, but this is also going to be a teachable moment for me to talk to you about my choice that I decided to lock consciously at 40. For me, it was it was my own it was my own kind of rites of passage. I hit forty. I was the CEO of Crystal Stairs. I was the leader of an organization, and I knew what my decision, the nonverbal message it would send to the largely women of color workforce I led, that you are perfect just the way you are. I also knew that there would be some people who would view it, whatever I said, as a political statement. And at 40, quite frankly, Sharon, I decided I was grown enough that it didn't matter how they chose to view it. I, you know, I just kind of come into my own, decided to lock. And I challenged my colleagues in the legislature. I said, you know, not one of you has ever decided not to vote on a Mitchell bill or a Mitchell budget because I'm dreadlocked. So my hairstyle choice has nothing to do with my professional workplace capacity. So why are we allowing employers and schools to to suspend children and send them home and employers not to hire and for employers to define what professional looks like when I am simply wearing my hair in its natural state So we defined in the law that hair is a race-based trait. My hair grows differently than my European sisters. And because of the texture of my hair and the way it grows, I have the privilege and opportunity to wear these unique hairstyles that require hair with a little extra curl and kink, right? Locks, twists, and braids. And it doesn't define, you know, straight hair doesn't, connote professionalism. Sharon, I had no idea that this bill would take off internationally the way it did. I had no idea that it would unleash this very painful conversation and stories that I have heard 
about the trauma Black people have experienced based on ignorance and naivete and a very, very narrowly defined ideal of not only what's professional, but what constitutes beauty. Anytime I'm in a room and people find out that I'm the author of the crown, I, I can see them coming for me. And they tell these really painful, horrible stories. We are the only group of people, Sharon, whose choice about a personal decision like a hairstyle was artificially limited and controlled by a workplace policy or a school dress code. No other group of people were impacted that way. So I say that to say that, you know, there were interesting conversations carrying the bill. Uh, I had one uh, colleague in the legislature who wanted to, wanted to have the brilliant legal, legal scholar that joined me, if, if she could define other race-based traits, which she happily defined for him as a legal scholar. I, I always find it interesting that he abstained from the vote, both in the Judiciary Committee and on the Senate floor. Uh, he saw me in the members lounge later and said, you know, I just I don't understand what all this is. And, you know, when you talk about chemical straighteners and what you have to go through the straightening here, you know, what do you mean, like a conch? I said, you know, it's fascinating. You're too young a man to even really know what a conch was. I wonder how that word even got in your vocabulary. So that's why representation matters and we have to be in the room so we can call it in real time. I must share a wonderful story. The bill passes in record time. The governor is committed to sign it and he's gonna have a bill signing ceremony, right? So I call the Crown Coalition members, uh, the links, the Urban League, Western Center on Law and Poverty, uh, um, Color of Change, all these amazing organizations, as well as AC from Dove and her team. And I invite them to the bill signing, right? This is, we're about to make history. It's the first state to sign, to sign a Crown Act. And they're all there and we're headed to the governor's office in the member's elevator. I put them all in the legislator's elevator with me. And we get on, I'm on my office on the fifth floor and the elevator stops on the third floor and the elevator door opens and who's standing there, Sharon? but the gentleman who wanted to understand what a conch was. And he says, oh, hi, Molly. Oh, the elevator's full. Where are you headed? And I said, we're going to the governor's office for a bill signing on the bill you didn't vote for as the elevator door closed. <laughs> and everybody in the elevator first clutched their pearls and then fell out in his hysterical laughter which I'm sure he heard as the elevator went down from the third floor to the first floor to our bill signing in the governor's office. It was the first bill signing he hosted because it was his first year as governor. And Sharon, he talked eloquently about, people are gonna try to trivialize this and they did. He got hit up on social media. People are gonna say, you know, California, they're, you know, that's the left coast. They have real issues to deal with like the unhoused and fires that were ravaging our state at the time. You know, this is just hair. It's just a hairstyle, change it. He said, it's not about that. He said, it's a form of discrimination. It is a form of race-based discrimination that we have, a, we have the power and the opportunity and the responsibility to bring to an end. He wow. got it. So that, that story about that bill gives you a flavor of me being in the room, bringing my full self to my job, leaning in, using power um, for good, using my superpowers for good, as we used to joke in my office, um, confronting bias cloaked as ignorance and naivete, and yet finding allies like the governor who didn't have to be spoon fed. He understood that it was racism, and was willing to use his bully pulpit and his platform to change the course of history. We're now in, I think, 14 states. A bill has been introduced in Congress. It's sitting on the US Senate floor. Hopefully we'll get through. Um, 
And this is a movement, not a moment. We are, um, and you know, all you have to do is walk into Target or Sally's and recognize that when the beauty industry, which is a multi-kazillion dollar in industry, understands, and we now have a full row of beauty products for African-American, for Black folks in our natural hair, versus, you know, back in the day where it was two little products, when we've got a whole aisle, um, when, when, when an industry in a sector like that um, begins to invest in companies and products for a market, that lets me know that they too know that it is a new market. We have a market share of this market um, and it's a movement and we're affecting culture change every day. Absolutely. And you know, I, I started this conversation talking about the miners canary. And in some ways the Crown Act is, um, demonstrates what hair did, it served as a proxy for so many things, you know, and it, if you really study it, it speaks to the major disconnect between our people and others. For example, the man who talked about conking, he probably has very little understanding about how much time was spent by black women in a beauty parlor on Saturday. How much money, how much, you, I mean, you can probably go on and on about that. So the imposition of us having to appeal to a standard that doesn't come to us naturally. It's like us requiring certain people to sit in a, in a tanning salon just to get a good job. You're gonna to have to shade your, <laughs> deepen your shade. <laughs> what a brilliant analogy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so We're asking to fundamentally change, change who, who you, you are. are. For a job, no change. Change your appearance, Sharon. Not, are you qualified? Do you have the skill set? You know, um, Charity, a woman I met going through this process, who who lost her court battle back in 2010, way before we introduced the bill, who was hired for a phone center job, a call center job, call center, interviewed. She may have pulled it back. If I pulled my locks back, people can't, you can't tell, right? I don't know what she did, but she wasn't trying to act like she didn't have locks. When she showed up for work the first day, having been made a job offer, Sharon, she showed up and the HR woman said, can I speak to you? Are those locks? She said, yes. She said, well, that's going to be a problem. And they rescinded the job offer. It's just interesting how invested people are in controlling others for something that is irrelevant to their job performance. Completely and utterly, completely and utterly. Like I told my colleagues, it hit me. As I stood there, I thought, none of you, for whatever reason, you have chosen not to vote for a Mitchell bill. It wasn't because I'm locked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to just share one little funny story about hair. Because okay. hair for me, and I think hair for a lot of Black women has so many connotations. It, it, oh, it, it does. Also, yeah, it talks does. so much. So my mother, obviously, who is, a, is of a different generation, yeah. um, my mom had taken a trip to Africa. And my mother was of the generation where she would not be caught dead without her straightening comb. That's right. Right. right? Even, so my, even on her trip to the continent. You know it. So she, she took an electric straightening comb with her. And she didn't have the right kind of adapter. So when she got into the hotel, the straightening comb wasn't working. So she actually considered not leaving the hotel for the entire time that she's in Africa because her hair is nappy. So then, so then she called, she thought about it and she calls me. <laughs> she says, Sharon, I was thinking about not leaving the hotel, but then it occurred to me, wait a second, I'm in Africa of any place this is where I could be okay. So, so I go out and I'm looking around. She says, Sharon, I got the nappiest hair in Africa. Every woman had on a wig or a weave or, so thank you, Holly, for introducing a piece of legislation that has gone global because Africa needs it too. We need to be free to appreciate who we are and don't let somebody else determine our standards of beauty. Sharon, I have been on panels with, with, with natural hair advocates and policy advocates from Brazil. You know, some of these nations where 
you know, you know, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Brazil, where, you know, we could have a whole nother conversation about colorism among black yes, people. Yes. But I, I, you know, my son who's 21, who has the most beautiful head of locks ever imaginable. I've seen a picture of him. He certainly does. Yes. And eyelashes out to here. And I don't know why the boys get all the good stuff anyway. Um, and you know, his story is an interesting one. He had a kind of false start. He, and, and, I always said, this is my personal choice. You know, you'll have to decide. He'd gone to school, elementary school with some young uh, boys who were locked. Their whole families were locked. I said, yeah, that's, you have to make your own decision and you need to be old enough. And he had a false start in high school. Started them, got a little pressure or extra attention that he wasn't comfortable with. Took them out. Year later, locked. He's been locked ever since. And they are stunning. He spent three months in Ghana. And in Ghana, Women may be locked, but men not so much. And so he calls me from Ghana thinking that he might cut his locks. And I'm like, yeah, that is phenomenal that you could be. At, and he was there the year of the return. He was there at this most amazing moment in the, the African diaspora history, feeling pressure about cutting his locks. Wow. Fortunately, he didn't. And I just say fortunately because, you know, I think you need to control your decision and not be influenced by others. Um, but I just remember hanging up the phone with from him thinking, who to thunk it? Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, our black hair is is political and personal, and we carry a lot of weight and history and ugly baggage as a result of it. And so for me, the Crown Act. It will be most significant and most valuable when it creates opportunities for conversation and self-discovery um, and culture change, as opposed to the law that's there as a backstop that when you need to sue, then you can sue. We don't want that to just be our only op opportunity. We want to create culture change. And when I heard that, you know, the Superintendents Association had a track on the Crown Act and their own training lets me know that we will change and not have so many of these school-based policies. When the American and the National Bar Association in their annual training opportunities for employment attorneys had a whole track on the Crown Act, I said, we're getting somewhere. When the National um, HR Professionals Affinity Group had a training on the Crown Act, I said, that's how you make systemic change. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of that history. Awesome. Well, I'd just like to thank you for sharing your time with us this afternoon. It's been a very fruitful conversation and um, I'm so proud of you and just wish you continued luck and success because your, your luck and your success means luck and success for the rest of us. So thank you. Sharon, thank you to you and your and your uh, better half, I'll say, <laughs> and all of your work and years of really putting forward, creating a space um, for progressives to have unapologetically progressive yes. news and conversations. And so I thank uh, the LA Progressive for this opportunity. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Have a great one. You too. Bye-bye.